Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. joining. It's really Absolutely. great to have you all here. Can you hear us all? Yes. Great. OK, so first of all, I want to actually start with like, the definitions of our longly worded title of our session around addressable. Can I actually start with what does this include and not include in terms of the definition of what addressable TV is? Now, of course, you're all smart, but there are over a 1,000 people here this year, and we just want to make sure we all mean the same thing when we're talking about this panel. So can I start, first of all, Adam, with your point of view? Uh, so addressable TV, really quickly, we talk about that as uh, one-to-one -one impression based or audience based buying um, using data on the back end to go ahead and match your targeting what it does not include uh, is DDL or data driven linear okay. which is basically uh, a form of index buying okay um, so it's not true addressable so we probably eliminate that in the discussion it will come up but in terms of addressable okay do either of you have another point of view or you want to add to that yeah I'll just add that I think you know, it's still TV as we know it. Everybody in this room understands what TV is. It's your professional, professionally produced content that we're watching now in the living room, on our phones, on the way to work, um, on Netflix, on an airplane. It's that content, but it's now serving as two specific households based on the audience that's actually watching the content. Um, and that's your linear, that's your streaming, your video on demand, etc. All right, Jay, do you want to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It's, it's exactly that. I think, I think there's, there's been a lot of talk of, sorry, <clears throat> CTV has just become the shorthand um, for addressable, um, and CTV for us is just a device. Um, three quarters of our, inventory, our addressable inventory is, is served via a CTV, but it's really important for us to not just think about CTV when we're thinking about how and where we're delivering um, full episode content that, that is addressable and that we're able to serve uh, addressable ads adjacent to. Okay, so now that we know what it's called and what the definition, can I just see a show of hands who's already in addressable TV? I'm hoping it's 100% show of hands. Oh, there's, there's still a few. Can I just check who's here from the agency side? Who's a buyer of addressable TV, CTV? No. Publisher side, hands up. Okay, a few publishers, brands, clients. Who's budget holders? Is there anyone with, I'm a budget holder, I'm a marketer. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Let's move on then to accuracy, because that is part of what we're focusing on. Can I just ask you, when it comes to addressable TV, how are different companies in the val value chain supporting or improving accuracy? What does it mean to you, Jay? Because this is something we debated behind, like, what do you mean by accuracy? I don't know if that's the right words. Um, we did debate it, and I think um, going from a place where um, traditional linear TV was all about buying broad audiences um, using, using panel-based data. Um, I think we're very lucky. We've got 35 million registered users. Wow, uh, we, we, we know enough about them. Uh, we, have, we have the technology and the enablement um, to deliver highly accurate addressable advertising to them all. Um, and I think from that perspective, when we also think about um, using brands data, um, brands um, have uh, a huge amount of knowledge as relates to their customers um, and what they're now able to do is, is deploy that accurately at scale um, across TV and we're, we're seeing a lot of brands um, utilize that opportunity um, to really... So can I ask, does accuracy mean like first party data? First party is that data, what, is yeah, that yeah, in yeah. this context? Look, just I'm very aware, look, understanding. we've talked so much about data over the last day and a half. Yeah. I'm going to go straight into literally how brands are using it yeah. uh, and actually the, the opportunity to accurately target um, adjacent to television content, um, their customers to either cross sell and upsell is an opportunity that we're seeing more and more advertisers deploy. Uh, we've now got over 20 different use cases that have used our data match product. You'll have seen Hannah and Lara introduce data match on this stage about an hour ago. Um, I'm very much responsible for how we scale that, how we bring more agility to that, how we develop more use cases and, and, and grow, that, grow that side um, to what we're doing at ITV because what, what BVOD provides um, to augment what you're doing in the linear space to drive incremental reach um, is becoming table stakes. It's, These sounds like some great tactics. And can I ask Adam, what would be your point of view on you know, where it's going with regards to incremental reach and, and you know, how to get, say, the light broadcast homes? 
Uh, well, the, uh, the omni-channel approach is one thing I think we always talk about, right? Bringing more um, uh, different avenues and, and the supply areas to go ahead and, and, you know, target your addressable. I think the, the, the one thing I think I should add to that and kind of what you said is like the evolution of addressable has been quite interesting of, you know, started on set-top box. And you're uh -huh. talking from the USA or from the I'm, UK? I'm talking USA market? approach, and I think this will go into global as we go, but from, from that approach, right? I mean, that's where, where I'm from and where I've been building addressable over the years. But how it started with set-top box, true one-to-one -one targeting. It was a DTH or the, the direct-to-home satellites that were doing it, direct and dish. Um, some of the other cable guys were doing what we call zonal addressable, where they really couldn't uh, do that direct-to-home, so they would do it kind of... Uh, into zonal areas. Yeah, um, almost like by cable operators exactly, as well, right? Exactly, through the quant-based right, delivery. <laughs> when um, <clears throat> CTD started to come in, everything in connected TV is, is digital, and thus, by definition, it's really all addressable. So every single impression is, in essence, addressable mm -hmm. within that environment. So then so can I you, tap in onto, like, what is the difference, for example, between contextually driven and placement decisions that are applied programmatically? Are you, are, like, is there more that you can explain when you're actually going into the buy? So, for example, what is age, age and gender and genres, and are you doing more now? Okay, so a, a shift there to contextual. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, taking away from addressable, contextual is a, a different method. Um, all buying, I believe, is going to be either contextual, addressable, or, or geo-targeted in some way yeah. at some point. There will be okay. some general non-targeted, but that's where we're going to go. Um, well, look, with addressable, everyone's been looking at it so much that they kind of forgot about contextual for a while, even though contextual is incredibly important. The thing about contextual that really helped to drive buying was it's what we call TV-like, right? Okay. So when we were starting to get CTV and OTT in there and buyers were just so confused, um, when you start to talk about contextual and genre-based buys and, and just the, the type of programming, that got TV buyers saying, oh, I get this, I understand this, okay. and that got them into connected TV and that type of buying, hence also through programmatic and other methods of how they can get to that or, or access that inventory. So contextual became a really good piece and a good part of how buying is starting to take off and becoming more holistic across all platforms. TV buyers, one of the things we've always tried to do is get the TV buyers in, the digital buyers in, um, into connected TV and into kind of this, you know, new world. Maybe they go back to TV, the digital buyers. We'll see with addressable, but it's another thing to talk about because it's impression-based. Um, but uh, that familiarity of contextual, to your question, um, got the TV buyers into buying the connected TV in the digital world. Which is really great. And can I just touch then on, for example, privacy? I think it's obviously also very important, where you've got all these different targeting capabilities, and it sounds like there's three front runners that, that you believe. In fact, three front runners, anyone want to add? Are there any other front runners in terms of addressable, you said zonal and contextual? Uh, addressable, contextual, and geo. I mean, okay. Those are, I think, the, yeah. okay, well, geo so really they think there's three uh -huh. key. What, <laughs> yeah. what is the impact on, on you know, a privacy first era and the need states, the intent based signals, are, are these going to diminish or are there like emerging solutions, for example? Fiona, mm -hmm. have you got a point of yeah. view here? I think, you know, brands need to start to work with partners who have future proof solutions and future proof data sets. You know, we can't keep going back to old school data collection. They're static, they're stale. This is what's really exciting is that intent is starting to come into the TV ecosystem. Intent being the ability to keep up with the changing behaviors and mindsets, right? Understanding audiences in real time, but in as a complement to what is already in place. You know, we already have the TV powerhouse where we need the reach, we need the geos, we need contextual. How can other elements add to that? And if we think of privacy first, it doesn't mean that intent data will be any less relevant. I think the contrary. Brands are now being able to talk to their consumers because their consumers have given them the permission to talk to them. So we are in a bit of an evolution where now you can actually talk to brands, sorry, talk to consumers who can become your advocates. If there is a lack of data or a lack of first party data, tap into your key partners, understand the different data sets out there, the different media buys out there to build holistic views of your audiences because there's so much out there it's just understanding which are the right signals now to move into that kind of next era which is privacy centric okay i'm going to ask jay a question i'm going to after i ask jay a question the mic will come round for so if you've got two questions in the room we would really love to take them so jay i actually just want to touch on yeah. you know it sounds like 
your solutions are trying to be built for lots of different buyers. So you might have a digital performance expert who's looking for certain, you yeah. know, getting actions done. You have your classic established, well-trained TV spot buyers. And then you probably have omni-channel experts that, that also really understand the power of t TV, but the, it's in a wider ecosystem of maybe five yeah. to six different touch points. What's your point of view? Like your solution specifically, who, who is it designed for? Is, is it designed for all of them? Um, well, cl clearly we're, we're, we're designed for uh, AV buyers, okay. um, and we always have mm -hmm. been, and we'll con they'll continue to be the mainstay of, the, of those that transact with us, at the very least. Let's, let's be clear, there is, a, there, there is a very long and wide um, and ever more expansive decision-making unit when it comes to um, the, 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 the body of people, both the advertiser and the agency. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to activating advertising. Uh, but look, in the development of Planet V, um, at, at the core of the developing Planet V was how do we broaden and simplify access to our inventory to, for a much wider okay. array of, of, of businesses. So we've got more brands direct transacting with us now. We've got much smaller digital agencies around the country. Great. We already had a network of 40 plus offices around the UK legacy of us being a, being a regional business, but many, many more of them are getting Planet V into the hands of, of literally hundreds of, of, of digital agencies around ah, democratization. the country. But, but then I think when, when, we, when, we sent, when we look more centrally, um, more and more of the bigger media agencies are really, really scaling up um, their offerings around e-commerce. As retail media becomes bigger, mm -hmm. um, I was talking to uh, one media agency lead at a Tesco event yesterday. Um, he's got a 20 strong, and this is a media agency, a 20 strong e-commerce team solely focused for big FMCGs on activating shopper media and shopper marketing budgets um, right through the retail media ecosystem from off-site through to on-site, myriad yeah. of options in store. Um, and, and those are increasingly becoming the types of um, the, the, the types of departments, let's call them, and specialisms yeah. and where it's growing. Um, that, that, that we need to be talking to and we are. Yeah. Are you seeing the, that as well? The commerce piece is, I mean, we're, we're going to see that, I think, really, really take off. I don't think that, that there's any question of that. You look at companies like the guys like Critio and, and some of that were just focusing yeah. entirely on, on this, this type of behavior. But the, the key is, too, is with addressable, you target, you've got that, that bullseye to target, and now you're getting a return. You're getting information back. You're getting a buy. You're getting some sort of attribution or something. Again, with commerce, it's like a, a, a wonderful connected piece there. But with the digital underpinnings of, of where we're going with delivery, it's just going to explode with commerce and some sort of talkback mechanism. Interactivity was like that for a while too, which I think that'll grow a little bit more as well um, through how things are being fed. So I think it's going to be pretty interesting as we go. Can I have a show of hands? Does anyone have any questions at this point for the panelists? There is a mic. We've got a we've got a hand over here. I, I don't need a mic. Oh, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> it's Mr. Justin Levin. It's the thing that irks me more than anything. Uh, our, our digital in inventory, 100% of our inventory right. is addressable and accessible programmatically. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about a linear business. Do you have any roadmap to Yes, yeah, so, so look, right, right now, the, the, the absolute focus is, is, is ITVX. We, mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us that had ITV Hub by now, um, if, if you go onto your phones, yeah. you'll see ITVX. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, tried I started seeing it about three weeks ago when, when I started simulcasting um, um, games from all around the world in, uh, uh, at, uh, 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 in Qatar. Uh, that, that, that's resolutely my focus right now, is, is how we enhance and boost our products and propositions set within that space. But, but, but as a business more broadly, we absolutely have a roadmap um, to make more of our linear inventory addressable. Um, that's going to become increasingly core focus for our business in 2023. Do you want to have a conversation with them over lunch or are you prepared to answer? <laughs> no, I'll, I just I'll want to give that. Look, 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 <laughs> no, this, this is, is good. There's, there's an increasing array. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. There's an increasing rate. Yeah, so so by by free by Freeview box, there there are there are there are there are there are web web enabled Freeview boxes. There's increasingly there's an increasing number of devices out there that 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 are that are IP addressed, um, but 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 ostensibly being used to service to service linear advertising. That presents an opportunity that that, that we're looking to figure out in 2023. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? That, You've had your bit. <laughs> Anyone else? Otherwise, we're going to carry on to the next section where we're going to talk kind of about the trade-offs, what mm. to be mindful of in this transition towards fully addressable. Um, okay, sounds like the, we can carry on. Yeah. All right, so we, we touched on contextual um, targeting against programs genre versus the audience-based targeting mm. and where those privacy permissions are not present. What are the trade-offs? Is there an upside? What do we need to be mindful of? Fiona, this is to yeah. you. Sure. So um, when I read the question, you know, contextual versus audience-based targeting, mm. you know, your, conte your contextual, your classic contextual, you know, reaching audiences based on the program they are viewing, great, great place to target people in a mindset watching a specific type of content. Your audience base being that kind of single person targeting. In the CTV environment, I think it's, ugh, there's still a lot of imprecision when we're matching. So the scale mm. is quite limited. So future of TV advertising today, what are we going to do to future-proof? And what are all partners, you know, such as Captify, who focus on the search data, how can we future-proof? And I think it's using the contextual elements, so understanding, using audience data, understanding who are the audiences that are watching specific content or specific programs, and matching that. So Captify, for example, we will match the search data to understand the intent based on different programming. Can you give an so, example? Just like, uh, you know, I know it's a lot of keywords. Can you like yeah. give us, imagine someone's watching TV. How, like, how does this work? Sure. Um, I think a good example is the World Cup now. Okay. I am an avid World Cup watcher. Um, absolutely love it. I but hope you're winning like Jay every, is here. So, <laughs> yeah, so sadly not. No, no bets have been won. But the, me as an, as an audience, I'm not a football fan. I do not watch football 11 other months of the year. So understanding the intent that I have, what is my profile, my interests in real time, based on context, don't just serve me with betting and, you know, mm. Bet35 and, and beers and whatnot. Sorry to be completely stereotypical, but... I'm just, I'm just aligning to you know, what we typically do see in contextual buys. So um, it's using contextual, which will always now be the mechanism for targeting in a privacy-centric manner, but other elements of data to understand more about the audience behavior behind, it, behind that. Okay. So and is it automatic content recognition technology? Like what, is, like what are the mechanics here? Yeah, to be honest, there's a, there's a variety. I think there's, okay. a, there's a big host. Um, we're working on a few future-proofed options. So come find me at lunch if you want to hear more, yeah. more about those. But I imagine it depends. If you're the infrastructure, you will have a very different perspective to the data, um, which is my side, etc. Gentlemen, do you want to add to this topic? Yeah, so um, look, I think, I think adjacency to content is, 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 is a big is a big aspect to how um, AV buyers have been, have, have, been, have been planning and executing media for years. Um, and on Planet V, we have, we have actually a, a wide array already of, of, of program-based or genre-based um, packages that are already available. And they, and they get great, great traction. Um, but in, in the ACR space, obviously, as, as, as with the demise of Cookulus, there's been this huge proliferation of technologies that can scan text-based content, mm -hmm. um, scan subtitles, um, and scan video. And, and we've been working, you know, we talked about 30 pilots um, yeah. earlier. Um, Ad, Ad Labs, yeah, we've got, we, we're looking at a number in 2023, but what, one of the toughest um, pilots that we brought to market has been our ACR product. Okay. Uh, we, looked at, uh, we looked at over a dozen different um, vendors of the solution. We're currently piloting a couple um, in an ACR solution that, 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 yep. that we launched about two months ago. Um, I think Hannah, Hannah touched on it very briefly. We've got a couple of segments available in pilot. Happiness mm -hmm. Moments, which ITV <laughs> naturally deliver brilliantly. Um, health and Beauty, Agreed. so mm -hmm. people putting makeup on and so on and so forth. I think it's um, absolutely and food critical. And drink, and food and, drink. And, and food and drink, to, to Hannah's point earlier, we have a ton of food shows quite easy to buy adjacency to food shows. But we also have food eaten in a lot of other shows that aren't food shows, soaps, for example. Yeah. 
Um, and what this, what this technology does, scans every scene of every show uh, and builds segments accordingly. And, we, and we're at, at Sainsbury's and Boots were pilot partners of ours. Um, and, and we're looking to sc sc scale that out in 2023. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting. Way, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I mean, let's give an example, like a beauty brand. Yeah. You know, let's take like a L'Oreal. I think they've got 40 brands or sub yeah. brands mm -hmm. underneath their their parent brand. Yeah. And if you're in digital, there may only be five viable segments that yeah. are. And and I think this is where TV we can really potentially open up the opportunity. How yeah. do you make sure that that portfolio going into a recession? is not cannibalizing each other. And yeah. I think th this is why this, this conversation is happening, mm -hmm. so that we can help them put guardrails between their segments, and, and hopefully people don't trade down during a recession. You can but protect the, your premium brands. We, we, we're not going to profess to have cracked it. This is very much a beta. We've just about understood how to ad serve. We've understood how to report. We're nowhere near cracking how to measure. So if anyone here has any ideas, grab me at lunch. <laughs> um, this is very much V1 of a pilot. Okay, so now I'm going to come on to a more a tr a trickier question, and we had a big debate because we're all from different um, parts of the lines of business and also different countries. I said, what do we need to still get right for brands that are seeking 100% coverage? And the word coverage was the word I'm classically trained audience development. And to me, imagine you're like a, hair, a, a dandruff hair shampoo brand or you're an air freshener brand, or you're a nappy brand. There are certain categories and brands where those categories have sizing, and most of our capabilities, we, we aren't necessarily servicing them very well. If you've got census data, you can do amazing performance work, and then with the likes of Nielsen and Barb, if you're a headline brand and you want a certain reach, you can absolutely achieve your goals, but then there are these middle brands that our solutions don't always help them. I call this the messy middle, where maybe using Barb, the shows are getting too low yeah. in the information, using census data for performance buying, where maybe it's not about audience, it's about, you know, I want an action, I want an outcome. How do we help these brands with the solutions that are emerging? Mm -hmm. I know we're not there yet. I think we have 20 years to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> It's so, difficult. So, yeah, I was going to say it's difficult. I think it's very difficult to also tell our brands, we know that you'll have 100% coverage of this market if you do this. It's a constant learning curve. I think when we're looking at the middle brands, they maybe only have access to specific types of data because of barriers to entry. So they need to be very clever with how their budget works and not just in terms of how they're reaching or the impressions that they are achieving through any tactics that they're getting, but what are partners providing as value adds off the back of it? We talked about incremental reach yes. or addressable reach. Mm -hmm. How can we add other value, right? Insights, measurement to just make sure that that coverage gets closer, closer to the target audience that we are aiming to reach. Um, but it's a very difficult problem to solve. I think if anyone knows that, you know, yeah. There, I mean, look, it's the power of data, mm -hmm. right? And there are products, like I know, like Comscore's predictive audience and stuff, and bring it more to the, the addressable world, but how to know up front how to better target, or how to know how to use logic to, to better perform and, you know, have a, a better frequency across your campaign. There mm -hmm. are ways that, that folks are using data to, to in, in, improve their goals. Um, and then be affordable to a lot of these brands. I think addressable itself, stigma addressable, I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, performance brands, DR brands, I mean, it's too expensive for them. And when you start to put in targeting mechanisms or you put them into a programmatic auction, you know, it just gets too expensive for them if you got bid density and they're yeah. just kind of priced out. Yeah. yeah. So you've and got also their buy cycles might be three months. Like how, how often do you buy air freshener? You're yeah. not buying it every week. Yeah. So yeah. we have, pro they have problems that we need to find solutions for. Yeah. And then of course, when you start to add more things, attribution, you start to add measurement, if there isn't measurement they're using or other, you know, it gets more expensive as well. And that takes out from the working media and what they're trying to do. So yeah. there's, there's a, uh, you know, a big piece of the business right now that everyone's just trying to figure out how do we get more money of the spend into eyeballs and make it affordable to many of these brands. Yeah. yeah. You're talking really about, by messy middle, you're talking about multi-portfolio businesses. Yes. Able to support. Yeah. And I think that's... And each category is just that not big enough for really live, linear, national, or yeah. omni-channel. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe, maybe I own dogs, and, my, and it's a dog food account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So that, that, that's an area, uh, that's a major product development area okay. for us. I think we've been talking, um, and I think Sky, Sky AdSmart have been doing this brilliantly for, for a number of years. Um, simplifying the, the entry point really for, for smaller brands um, to use data uh, and the myriad of data that's out there um, mm -hmm. to, to, to find, to find con concentrations of audience that are relevant for, 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 for a particular brand. And are you seeing any, like, you what, know, what, in your betas? Are you seeing so accuracy? So what, we, what we've just developed is a, is a product called Matchmaker. Okay. Um, and Matchmaker we've specifically designed um, for brands that don't have access to their own data but, but, but wish to target and, and utilize um, grocery or, or high street retailer data. We've just done deals with, with Tesco and with Boots. Um, and what's really interesting, you know, um, we've had, we, uh, uh, Kelly, who was on stage yesterday morning, announced that at our event three weeks ago, we've been completely inundated um, with, with, with inbounds from the, the, the broadest possible range of, of FMCGs, um, from the very big, the obvious candidates who, um, who, who rely on Boots and, and Tesco for distribution um, very, very heavily. What's really surprised us, though, um, are the, the, the sheer volume of startups that, that have inbounded us. Um, a startup in the pet food category that have literally just secured one single shelf spacing for one single brand three years ago didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. um, they had, last year they had a six figure budget, now they're trying to get to a seven figure budget. Amazing. Last year they spent it all across the platforms with Meta and now with, with Tesco targeting and that one single racking in the pet food aisle in Tesco. Mm -hmm. It's great to hear they're, brands they are graduating super keen to, to invest in those. And I think, <laughs> as I said, Sky have done this really well, I think, for, for a number of years. But I think yeah. that's where I think retail media can go is supporting those low penetration NPD fast yeah. growth businesses getting into retail and to scale up and to, and scale, to scale up really up. fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're just going to oh go ahead. I was just going to add I think it's also you know, understanding problems before products. If I have dandruff, yeah. I know where I'm going to buy my dandruff and it'll probably work for me. So I'll continue going there. What are the problems mm. that people may face before they are in that bottom of yes, the funnel, right? I say and being then the consideration yeah. before right. the consideration. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So Absolutely. understand the product a moment to then yeah. put your brand kind of front and center, and TV is yeah. a great mechanism great. to do that. We're now going to just change tracks to talk a little bit about creative because obviously all of this exciting technology, we know data is great for finding the right people, but let's actually just the moment of truth of when you get to have that opportune conversation, the right product, the right audience, mm -hmm. and the right timing. What is the impact on creative and production? And specifically, you know, is there more customized ads that need to be made? Yeah. Is the cost to justify those ads? Um, is it there? And then can advertisers afford to have mass optionality of ads to meet mass addressability of advertising targeting? And Jay, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, DCO is a focus. Uh, and, and again, I've seen a lot of content covering DCO over the last day and a half. Um, we, we've built um, a number of products in this space around dynamic creative, the ability, and, and, and partnerships um, with, with businesses that allow, allow, enable us to, to deliver a dynamic creative solution. Have you got like a what, checklist of when it's worth it? Like what, what do you tell brands? So, 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 so right, right, right now, we, we, we run a handful of campaigns for ourselves. What, what, we, what we've really identified is that actually advising advertisers on this is not really our job yeah mm -hmm. um, and so so what we're about to launch I think well Omnicom have already announced is a, is a really interesting partnership with Omnicom's DCO business they, they, they have a hundred strong business within within OMG Omnicom media group called the Dillick yeah whose job it is just to do DCO yeah. mm -hmm. um, and I think rather than us our role is to ostensibly bring our media proposition to life for, for, for buyers what we're not equipped to do is get really upstream into creative agencies yeah. to advise them on this. Okay. But with a, by partnering with Idyllic, you can. who are a really interesting business, um, they, 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 have, they, they have really great dialogue with all of Omnicom's ad agencies as well. So Adam and Eve and, and Abbott Mead Vickers. 
we're not going to get penetration into the creative agencies to okay. help understand this. Right. And they've built a scaled offering that uses tech, data, but also expertise. Did you want uh, to, to add anything on the that. point of creative? Yeah. I, well, I, I can add to just your point. I mean, one of the things we're doing at Cinemedia is we're focusing a lot more on advertising, right? We have a, uh, an addressable ad serving and decisioning product or system that's out there in the marketplace globally. And we're really working on a lot to your point of yeah. working with our clients and teaching them not just here's technology, but how to use it, how to best make money from it, um, how to optimize your buys, how to work with it. And look, part of that will probably be over time creative. I think creative is going to be one of the biggest things as we move on, as ads are becoming more addressed, more targeted. We talked about, um, you know, retail media and, and um, you know, commerce. And all that. It, it, we're going to get into a world where, where ads are going to be targeted based on where you are, based on time of day, based on your third impression, knowing you're yeah. commuting to work. It's going to be different than what it was in the morning when you woke up to, you know, so frequencies will start to get played with as well. It's expensive. Um, yeah. It costs yeah. something to do that. But I think with programmatic, um, you have an opportunity where you may be able to do that in a, in a better way through different type of auctions where it can be affordable. But um, yeah, that is, that is, I think, where we're going to go. And it puts a lot of onus on, on the creative side of the business to say, all right, look, we're, ads are going out there, great. Um, people are watching on all screens. And by the way, any piece of glass is a screen where an ad is going to be served. How do we go ahead and make that some way where the creatives can be different based on frequency, based on how many times people have seen that? And that is where a lot of companies are starting to work on, where you know, we're going to start okay, to Okay, I'm going to ask into. a question mm -hmm. now about recession-proof tactics. And I want them all to give some feedback. And then a questions from the audience, and we're going to wrap up with future predictions. So can I just ask you now, moving on to recession impact, we are going to 2023. It looks like a tough year across the board. Are any of you making changes to your solutions or your messaging to help brands face the next 12 to 18 months? What, what do they need to hear? We um, commercially aren't changing anything at the moment. However, a lot of our brands are coming to us and saying, we are having a lot of pressure to justify budget on plan. So we need to think more addressable, but we need to think omni-channel. How can your expertise, which is now across environments like display, online video, CTV, out of home, how can you help me plan holistically to make my budgets work harder? Um, you know, that's kind of the stance we're taking for now. Of course, we'll, that could change, and we can, you know, do things to support brands as they do face a difficult year. Okay. More, more with us with our, our clients and really I think the supply side, the publishers. But we're in a cost savings right now. We're cost in that savings. mode, and everyone is looking mm -hmm. at how to save costs, right? How to be a profitable business. We we know about the big news about not as much sub concentration, but you know, right now it's about saving money and running a, a, a sound business, for and we're really working flow. on our business models with okay. our clients to better mm -hmm. appease them. Uh, so ITV, look, a, a lot of brands are wrestling with the cost of living crisis and where, where we are right now. Um, and our, we, we, we're very lucky we've got a really substantive client strategy and planning team at, uh, at, at ITV. And what they're producing is um, a myriad of studies on an ongoing basis to help clients navigate that. Um, a lot of big agencies are, 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 are providing that advice, yeah. but, but with more and more um, more and more clients coming client direct, fast growth clients that want to talk to us directly. Yeah. Uh, we're doing more and more work to help um, brands understand how to navigate cost of living, uh, the this, 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 this sorts of content they should be creating, um, the this, this sorts of partnerships they could be doing with us. Um, we did a huge study earlier in the year called What Unites a Kingdom. And, and, and what, what, we're, what we're doing through on insight like this is just helping brands understand better um, how they should be adapting what they're doing from, from an above the line space. So Justin said, no questions, Laura. He literally went like this to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap with where is this going and what next for the future of addressable TV? Specifically, we've touched on a lot of ways to get incremental reach, accuracy, the way the market's moving. Each one of you, I'd love to hear from you. Where do you see it's going? And if you'd love to ask them more questions and find out which one of their fibs is true, you can do that over the break. Can I start with you, Jay? And me first. Yeah. Uh, many, many more new to TV brands. I hope that's also a truth. <laughs> new to TV brands. Fiona. Um, bringing the best of digital and the best of TV together. It's the only way I think we will flourish, but it needs to start happening now. 
to support brands in the future. Thank you. Adam. A uh, buyer comes in and says, I want to get impressions across every piece of glass um, with the right frequency, serve it across everywhere, um, and give me true attribution and results that they were seen, there was action, and when, and I could optimize accordingly, probably all through automation. I really think that was hopefully three truths and not two truths and a lie. Thank you, all, everyone. Thank you for the panelists for all of their wisdom. Thank um, you. This was a really, really great session. Uh, if you have questions, come see us on the lunch break or for the rest of the day.